An essay where you are asked to compare and contrast is extremely prevalent and very popular, so you're probably going to be asked to write one of these types of essays at some point. So it's important that you are prepared to do that. So look at this example, running and swimming as forms of exercise. So in this example, you'd be asking to compare and, co and contrast running and swimming. So look at running and swimming and talk about how they are alike. That's the compare part of it. And the contrast part is talking about how running and swimming are different. But remember, you're not just talking about running and swimming. You're talking about them as forms of exercise. So think about how running and swimming are similar in terms of exercise and how they are different forms of exercise as well. So there are a few things to remember when writing one of these essays. First, have purpose. Don't just compare and contrast something just to do it. Have some kind of purpose, like that way your reader can determine which is the best form, or sometimes it's to show your reader which is the best choice. Then pick your style. Sometimes you can go back and forth, like you can talk about how running and swimming are alike in this way, and then talk about how they're alike in this way. Or you can just talk about running, keep talking about running, and then talk about swimming. So the choice is talk about running and then swimming, or talk about running and swimming back and forth throughout the entire essay. The choice is yours, just decide which one is most effective. And then finally, derive purpose. Now I know I just put that up there, but it's very important. Don't just write an essay where the reader comes to the end of it wondering why they even read your essay. Give them some kind of purpose to comparing and contrasting the things that you have been talking about through the entire paper. So remember those things and you'll be on your way to writing a great essay. Figurative language. Figurative language is language that goes beyond the literal meaning of a word and authors will use figurative language to enhance their writing. Some common examples of figurative language are hyperbole, simile, metaphor, and personification. So we'll discuss each of those and I'll give you some examples for each. Hyperbole is exaggeration. People will say something and you aren't meant to take it literally. You're meant to know it's an exaggeration, but it's there just to emphasize how strongly the author is trying to convey something. For instance, I've told you a million times. I bet some of you have probably heard that one. And a million times, really, probably you haven't heard whatever your parent or teacher has said they've told you a million times. It's an exaggeration. It's hyperbole. It's meant to emphasize that they've already told you this a lot more times before now. Another example would be, I had a ton of homework. You did not literally go home with 2,000 pounds of homework, but you're telling people, I had a lot of homework. It was way more than the normal amount. It was a ton. It was that much homework. So that's what hyperbole is, exaggeration. Next we've got simile, which is comparing two things using like or as. And this is very important. You have to use those words like or as or it's not going to be a simile anymore. So, the child howled like a coyote. We see our word like. You're comparing two things in this sentence. The child howled like a coyote compares the child to a coyote using the word like. This example is letting you know that the child is loud. It's crying sounds like a howl, much like a coyote. So this figurative language is used to bring a coyote to mind to help you picture and hear in your mind how this child is screaming or crying. Next, let's look at this example. She ran as fast as lightning. Well, that's going to compare two things here, and we see the word as. So what is being compared in this sentence? She ran as fast as lightning. And usually when you have one as, you've got two. So, it's comparing she, or a girl, to lightning. 
And that is being done by using the word as. So when you're comparing a girl to lightning, you're saying she's that fast. It went so fast you barely got to see her before she got past you or got to the finish line. So it's just letting you know she's really, really fast. So that's what simile is. Comparing two things using like or as. And again, these are the important words to look for to make it actually be a simile. It could be a metaphor, which compares two things without using like or as. And that is really the big difference between a simile and a metaphor. A simile uses like or as. A metaphor does not use like or as. So let's look at some metaphor examples. She was lightning running down the track. So this sentence is very similar to this one. They're both comparing she or a girl to lightning. They're both saying this girl is really fast, but this one just says she was lightning. She was lightning running down the track. It doesn't say she ran as fast as lightning. It doesn't use like or as, it just says she was lightning. So it's a different way to use the same kind of figurative language. So that's one example of a metaphor. Let's look at this. And this is an excerpt from Edgar Allan Poe's poem, The Raven. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming. Now this one's a little trickier because it doesn't just come out and say this was this or this is this. Like here it said she was lightning. But it says that his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming. So we're comparing his eyes to a demon's eyes which is basically comparing him or a man to a demon. If his eyes are like a demon's eyes, then this man is being compared to a demon, which is to maybe say that the man is evil. It doesn't mean he's literally a demon. It means he's got some characteristic of a demon. He's maybe an evil person. So in poetry, your figurative language may not always pop out at you if it's a metaphor. A simile is pretty easy to spot because you'll see like or as, but a metaphor might be a little trickier. So just look for what two things are being compared in that sentence or that phrase of a poem. And the last piece of figurative language we're going to discuss is personification which is when an inanimate object is given human qualities. You are personifying it. You are making it do something a person would do even though it's not something that can do these things. And remember, inanimate objects are going to be things that are not alive. A chair, a teapot, the wind, water, those are inanimate objects. So the example here, the water slapped the side of the boat. The water slapped. Can water actually slap like a person would slap? No, but it makes you think of the action of slapping and the sound you might hear with the slap whenever you picture this water slapping the side of the boat and that's why they're using this particular word and personifying the water. Depending on what the story is about where this sentence appears, it could be that the water is being made as like a, an evil character. If someone drowns in this story, then the water would be seen as an enemy and so it slapping the side of the boat would give it that negative feeling. Another example, the teapot shrieked. Shrieking, screaming, that loud sound, you can hear it in your head when you think about the noise a teapot makes. But a teapot isn't actually shrieking like a person would. It's simply making that noise because the air is hot enough that it's trying to get out now. Or the wind howled. Wind can't howl like a wolf would howl. But wind makes that same kind of sound sometimes, and so the author is trying to put that sound of howling in your mind when they're describing the wind. So figurative language can be a lot of different things. Hyperbole, where you're exaggerating. Simile, where you're comparing two things using like or as. Very important markers for a simile. 
metaphor where you're comparing two things without using like or as, and personification when an object is given human qualities whenever it's personified. And all of these techniques are used so that the words will go beyond the literal meaning of them and give you a deeper understanding of the poem or the work that you're reading. The author is trying to go beyond the words and make you really think about their meaning and put certain connotations in your head whenever you're reading. Inference. Inferences are conclusions that a reader makes using clues in the text. So an author may not explicitly say something, but they leave little hints behind and you have to connect the dots to form a conclusion. And inference is different than making a guess because it is based on evidence. So you read, you pick up on those clues or hints that the author leaves behind, and you put them all together to form your inference. So let's look at a couple of examples. Charlotte's toddler is in bed asleep upstairs. She hears a loud thump and then loud crying. So knowing that the toddler is in bed asleep and then hearing a thump and crying, you can infer or Charlotte can infer when she's at home that her toddler fell out of bed. Now our example doesn't say the toddler fell out of bed and it doesn't say Charlotte ran upstairs and found her child on the floor but because you know the kid was in a, in a bed sleeping and then you hear a thump probably against the floor and then crying because the kid is hurt or scared from waking up in the middle of the night on the floor unexpectedly, Charlotte can infer that her toddler fell out of bed or the reader can infer that that's what, happening, what happened whenever they're trying to process the story and figure out what the author was trying to tell them with these clues. So let's look at another example. Nolan sees cookie crumbs on the floor and chocolate around his son's mouth. So cookie crumbs on the floor, chocolate around his mouth is going to tell you that Nolan's son got into the cookie jar. And it may not be the cookie jar, it may be that he got into a pack of cookies, but you don't really know the rest of that. You just know that if there are cookie crumbs on the floor and chocolate around his son's mouth, that the kid got into cookies somehow. So you can infer he got into a cookie jar or a pack of cookies without knowing, without the author explicitly saying that to you. And that's all it is. That's all inferences. Reading something and coming to a conclusion. A lot of the times it's really obvious things. If you see a lady come into a store and she's dripping wet and it's raining outside, you can infer that she doesn't have an umbrella. So some things are just common sense, they come to you, you don't even realize you're making an inference. But in the end, an, it, an inference is just a conclusion that a reader makes based on evidence. Purpose. An author writes with one of four purposes in mind. To inform, to describe, to entertain, or to persuade. Once we figure out which one of these four purposes the author is writing with, we will be able to better understand his or her motivations for writing. If the author is writing to inform, it will probably be nonfiction. And some examples you might see are research papers or recipes. You are getting information. The author is informing you of something. They're informing you how to do something. It's nonfiction. Their purpose is simply to inform you. If the author's purpose is to describe, it will probably be fiction and it's going to have lots of details. A descriptive story or paper is going to 
elaborate on details. It's going to give you as much description as possible and a lot of times that's going to be something that's a work of fiction. While you will have details in an informational paper or, or writing of some sort, it's not going to be the same kind of details you'd get in a descriptive fictional narrative. If the author's purpose is to entertain, then it will also probably be fiction. And you will have humorous and or dramatic elements. Now, something that's funny or humorous is going to be entertaining, but something dramatic can be just as entertaining as something funny. And some of the best stories are going to have humorous and dramatic elements in them. So something written to entertain is usually fiction, and it will sometimes have both of the, these elements, or sometimes just one or the other. But it's written to entertain you, to make you feel entertained, like you are um, reading a story that you are enjoying. If the author is writing to persuade you of something, you are probably going to see an editorial or an advertisement. All those ads you see on TV are meant to persuade you to buy something, persuade you that one product is better than another. So that is where advertisements are going to be one of the primary places that you see persuasion writing. Um, an editorial in a newspaper may lean toward or against um, a certain topic or candidate in a political campaign, and so those are also written to persuade you one way or the other. But most people are going to see ads on almost a daily basis, whether it's on the internet, whether it's on the TV, whether it's on a billboard driving down the highway. So this is something you'll see every day whether you're trying to or not. So the four main purposes an author will write with are to inform, to describe, to entertain, or to persuade. And once you determine what the author's purpose in writing is, you will better be able to determine the author's motivation for crafting his work. Theme. Theme is the overall idea of a piece of literature. So think about the lesson or moral of the story that the author is trying to get across to you. One thing to remember is do not confuse theme with plot. Plot is what the characters do. It's the action of the story. It does not have to do with the overall lesson or message that the author is getting across. Now obviously what the characters do is going to help you understand the theme, but plot and theme are not the same thing. Plot is going to be more about human nature, society, and life in general. There can also be more than one theme. The author may have one overall message, but there may be a few messages in there, or you may be able to find more than one theme besides the main controlling theme of the story. Some questions to ask yourself are, what is the lesson or message? And some common themes are, man struggles against society, man struggles against nature, overcoming adversity, the importance of family and friendship, man struggles with faith, sacrifices bring rewards, and honesty is the best policy. So for all of these, I want us to look at the story of the tortoise and the hare from Aesop's Fables. And this shows you that there can definitely be more than one theme for one story. Now all of these may not be what Aesop had in mind when he was coming up with this fable, but I was able to see all of these themes in the story. The last one I couldn't come up with something for, but I've got a good one for that as well. So man struggles against society. You've got this tortoise who feels like he's going to keep going and he's going to try to win the race, but all of society is against him and saying, oh, that hare has got you beat. He's way faster than you. I don't know why you think you're fast enough to beat him. So I'm sure that tortoise was struggling 
against society's views of him. Another one would be man's struggle against nature. The tortoise is struggling against the nature of his self, how he's made. He's obviously not going to be as fast as the hare. Um, he's going to have to go up hills. He's going to be fighting against the very nature of his self where the hare is made to go much faster. Overcoming adversity. Just simply winning the race, the tortoise ended up winning even though no one expected him to do it. Even though people were probably telling him, oh, you can't do that. The hare is always going to beat you. The importance of family and friendship. Now, I've talked a lot about society, telling the tortoise he couldn't do this, but I'd like to think that the tortoise had some family and friends on his side that were urging him on, that helped him feel like he could actually go through and win this race. Man struggles with faith. The tortoise had to have faith in himself. The hare was very, very cocky. He felt like he had this race won so much so that he went and took a nap, where the tortoise didn't do that. He had faith in himself and knew that he could do this if he just kept going, if he gave it his all. And then sacrifices bring rewards. The tortoise sacrificed that nap that the hare took, and in the end, he won the race because he just kept going. Now, the moral of the story they give you is slow and steady wins the race, but I can see all of these themes in that story. Now, honesty is the best policy. I couldn't really come up with one for, but you can always look at Pinocchio. Pinocchio, every time he told a lie, his nose grew. It was not a good thing. Every time he lied, something bad happened to him. I won't ruin the whole story for you, but everyone knows about the growing nose, which is a sad punishment for someone who is not using honesty. So it's showing you honesty is the best policy. So whenever you're reading a story, you can look at what the characters are doing to figure out what the plot is, but remember the theme is different. The theme is going to be the controlling idea in that piece of literature. And you want to ask yourself, what is the lesson or moral the author is trying to get across to me? When taking your exam, you may come across questions where they ask you to determine fact from opinion. And sometimes this can be a little tricky. Obviously, when taking a test, if you know the right answer, you always go with what you know is the right answer. But if you find yourself in a situation where you're not entirely sure what the right answer is, perhaps you're running short on time, maybe two or three of the answers look like they might be correct, uh, this little bit of advice might be very helpful, especially on this kind of question, whether it's fact or opinion. When asked about a statement, whether it's fact or opinion, remember that choices that are facts will have no ambiguous words in them. They typically will have no ambiguous words. Let me give you an example here. Um, Listen to this sentence. How long is a long time? Well, of course, that's extremely ambiguous because long, in reference to time, may be up to each person. My young son thinks that five minutes is a long time, and yet five minutes is not nearly enough time in my experience. So uh, the ambiguity of the word long there uh, tips you off that this is opinion rather than fact. And it's typically this case. Let me give you one more to show you what I mean. What defines an ordinary person? Well, what's ordinary to me may not be ordinary to you or ordinary to someone else. That word ordinary, once again, is ambiguous. It's left up to each person's opinion. So that lets you know, all right, we're talking opinions here. Now, sometimes it's not clear. You may say, well, all of them seem to have some words of ambiguity in them. Well, once again, I said this is typically the case that fact statements typically will not have uh, words of opinion. But if you find a situation where they all seem to have words of ambiguity, the next thing you look for is the complete context of the question. And given that context, what you usually find is that the fact answer comes out in terms of a research finding. So let me give you an example of that. The scientist found that the eye reacts quickly to change in light. So the research finding there, given the whole context of the uh, question there, will let you know that, okay, this is the fact here. Even though there may be some ambiguity in there, I don't know the scientist, I don't know what he found, the fact that it's a research finding says, ah, okay, this is a fact. So typically you're looking for uh, ambiguous words, lets you know opinion, but looking at the whole context, you may see 
I don't see any here, just merely of facts. They, they all have ambiguous words. You look at the whole context and you say, okay, well, here's a research finding. That's the factual one there. So um, opinions are set out in the context of words like so-and-so thought something, they believed something, they understood something, they wished something. So you're looking for those opinion words, thought, believed, understood, wished. And here's an example of that. He thought the Yankees should win the World Series. That's not a statement of fact, it's a statement of opinion. And we know that because we're tipped off immediately by that word, thought. He thought, he believed, he wished uh, that the Yankees should win the World Series. And hopefully this uh, little technique will help you out when you're taking your test. I once again want to reiterate, if you know the right answer, always go with that. But when you hit a little stumbling block, when you're not entirely sure, uh, this will help you make a better educated guess. Um, fact statements avoid ambiguous terminology or are often listed as research results. Uh, opinion statements, once again, have ambiguous terminology, terminology that's up to my perception, your perception, someone else's perception, and often include the words thought, believed, wished, or understood. If you'd like to learn more about this study further, I encourage you to go to the website linked beneath this video. If you click on the link, it'll take you there where you'll find an ebook ready for immediate download. A technical passage is a piece of writing used to describe a complex object or process. So that's the main point of a technical passage, to describe a complex object or process. Because of that, a technical passage is always going to be nonfiction. Many times technical passages will relate to something in the medical or technological fields. I'm just going to abbreviate technological. So technical passages could be about many different types of fields, but generally things in the medical and technical fields are complex, so that's why a lot of technical passages will relate to those fields. So the goal of an author when writing a technical passage is to state everything simply and clearly. In order to accomplish that goal, the author has several tactics it will often use to state everything simply and clearly. The first is by putting everything in a logical order. The second tactic is to use subheadings and headings. And the third tactic is to use letters and numbers. That sounds very vague, but what I'm talking about here is by numbering the main points or using letters to separate sections of the paper. And because of uh, using lots of subheadings and headings and letters and numbers, oftentimes a passage will appear more like an outline than an actual piece of writing. But nevertheless, that's fine because the goal of the writer here is to describe the complex object or process simply and clearly. So that's the important thing to pay attention to there. So just to review, a technical passage is for the purpose of describing a complex object or process. And everything needs to be stated simply and clearly. So the three tactics an author can use are logical order, subheadings and headings, and letters and numbers. Noticing an author's position is very vital to understanding a piece of writing because every writer is going to have a personal bias or they're going to have their, a certain position on whatever they're writing about. So the way they portray something in their writing may not be totally accurate. So it's vital that you as a reader understand the author's position so you can better understand their work of writing. So first of all, the author's position is basically their stance on the issue at hand. It's what they believe about the issue they are writing about. So to help you find the author's position, you need to notice several things. Notice each point here starts with the word notice. Because to find the author's position, you can't just sit back and have it come to you. You as the reader are going to have to be proactive and notice these things. So first of all, notice personal opinions. So this is basically noticing when someone is interjecting their own thoughts about something. 
instead of actually putting fact in there. Notice bias. This is when someone words a sentence or a paragraph so that they portray something as being good or maybe portray something else as being bad. In other words, they're not giving fact anymore. The way they word something casts something into a negative light or makes something look very good or very positive. Also, notice emotional language. This is when a writer puts their own thoughts into something or their own opinions into something. And then by using strong emotional language, tries to sway the reader over to their thinking. Now remember again, we're not talking about a persuasive paper because persuasive papers are always going to have a certain author's position in it because that's the idea of a persuasive paper, that the author is trying to sway you a certain way. So we're not focusing on persuasive papers. Focusing on other kinds of papers when the author really isn't supposed to have a bias, when they're not supposed to have a position on the issue. But nevertheless, they are going to have a position. And so sometimes they'll insert emotional language to try to persuade someone to their thinking. Then also, notice what information is left out. Because when we're talking about personal opinions, bias, and emotional language, these are all things that are going to be added to the paper. This is something an author may add to the paper uh, to insert their bias or to insert their own position. But noticing what is left out is when the author doesn't write something to support their position. This may be some fact that would look bad upon their own position, so they just leave it out. So sometimes it's hard to know what is left out because it's not there. And if you don't know anything else about the topic at hand, you may not know what pertinent information is being left out. But sometimes that can be helpful um, to understanding the author's position. So the important thing to take away from this is that the author's position is their stance on the issue at hand. In any piece of writing, um, that is out there, the author who wrote it, is going to have a position on that subject. So it's up to you as the reader to determine how strong that position is portrayed in the paper. And to notice any time anything is skewed or the facts are twisted a little bit um, and when the author is trying to persuade you to believe like they do. A bias is basically when an author is unfair or inaccurate in his or her presentation of something. In their attempt to persuade, writers often make mistakes in their thinking patterns and writing choices. This is because every author has a point of view. And that's important to remember. Every author has a point of view. Which is basically just the way they look at something, the way they see a certain situation. So because they have this point of view, naturally in their writing, they oftentimes will show their point of view through their writing. And so that's when a bias comes into play. So it's not necessarily bad for an author to have a point of view. They're just naturally going to have one. But it is a problem when they start to include it in their writing. So that's when a bias comes into play. And so a bias is when someone ignores reasonable counter-arguments or distorts opposing viewpoints. So you as a reader need to be aware when an author is being biased. So look for any clues like when they only talk about their own arguments for something and don't talk about any opposing ideas. Or when you are aware of another viewpoint and they share the viewpoint but they don't share it exactly correct. So be aware of those types of things and then once you are tipped off once that a writer is being biased, you will know that other times they, when they present opinions that those opinions may also be biased. When defining words found in a text, often words have a, a definition that is more than the dictionary definition. So we can say that words have two definitions, a denotative meaning and a connotative meaning. The denotative meaning is the literal meaning of the word. So basically if you're wondering what the word meant and it's the denotative meaning, then you could just look up the word in a dictionary and the dictionary definition would describe the meaning of that word. However, the connotative meaning of the word also involves the emotional reaction a word may invoke. It depends on the reader's associations they may make with that word. So it goes further than the denotative meaning. And so denotative meanings are generally used in nonfiction works. Whenever um, in a nonfiction work the writer isn't trying to be flowery or use figurative language, so the actual definition of the word is what the word means in that context. However, in fiction works, the connotative meaning of a word also is, uh, is often meant. So it's important that readers learn to differentiate between when the connotative or denotative word 
or denotative meaning is being used. And so the reader can usually determine by the context clues whether the author is using the denotative or connotative meaning of a word. Almost any type of writing is descriptive and then it seeks to describe a certain person, place, thing, or idea. But a descriptive text is more specific and then it takes one particular subject and then tries to depict that clearly to the reader. So we could say that a descriptive text focuses on one subject. So it focuses on one subject and then tries to depict that subject clearly to the reader. And when you think of describing something, that means using lots of adjectives and adverbs, lots of descriptive words. So, as you can imagine, a descriptive text is going to have lots of adjectives and adverbs. So I'm just going to abbreviate adjective and adverb. So when you think about a descriptive text, that means it's going to include details. So you want lots of details in a descriptive text. That's what the writer is going for. So over here you have too many details. Because even though you're trying to, the writer is trying to include lots of details, there can be too many. But on the other end of the spectrum over here, if there's not enough details, the paper can be vague or unclear. So what the writer is trying to accomplish here is a happy medium, somewhere in the middle, where the paper is not vague or unclear. It's, it's very clear and very precise, but there's not so many details that the reader gets bogged down in all of the extra information. So as a writer, um, you should look to try to go in the middle in a descriptive text. And if you're reading something, you want to read things that are descriptive where the writer has a good balance of details in the paper. The purpose of an expository passage is to enlighten and inform the reader. But to state it more simply, the purpose of an expository passage is to teach. Because the purpose of this type of passage is to teach, everything here is going to be accurate. So that's why it's always going to be in a nonfiction passage. The topic of a passage of this type is always going to be very simple. It's going to be a simple topic. It's also going to be a very easily defined topic because the writer of a type, one of these types of passages wants the reader to be able to understand what they're saying very easily because they're trying to teach them something. So it's going to be Everything's going to be very simply stated so that the reader can understand what the writer is saying. Oftentimes, expository passages will contain words like first, next, for example, or therefore. The reason these types of words would be used is because the reader, or excuse me, the writer is going to make a point that talks about the topic and then back things up uh, with certain details. So in other words, the writer is going to state a fact and then back it up with details. So they might say, this is because first, second, and finally, or next we're going to talk about this argument for our topic, or he might give a certain example about a topic and then say, for example, or because of this, therefore, everything is revolved around teaching. So any words like this or any other words that may go along with teaching something are going to be used in these types of situations. So the important thing to remember is that an expository passage is meant for teaching and it's going to be nonfiction. Every piece of writing should have a logical conclusion, and it's your job as the reader to identify that conclusion, mainly for the purpose of helping you to understand whether you agree with the writer or not. Because you don't want to just read a piece of literature, you want to analyze it. So one step in that process to better understanding it 
is identifying the conclusion to know whether you agree with the writer or not. So now I want to talk about how to identify that conclusion. So you're going to need to infer a lot or make an inference. And to infer something just means to take what you already know and combine it with something else to draw a conclusion. So it's pretty, pretty self-explanatory. And so what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to combine two things. What you already know with the info or the information found in the text. So I'm going to draw a double arrow there because to make an inference, you're pulling these two things together, everything you find in the text, any pre-knowledge you have, and you're pulling that together to draw the conclusion. And generally, a conclusion should be obvious. If a writer does a good job in their writing, then the conclusion should be easily identifiable. Otherwise, you may draw a conclusion that is not the conclusion the writer had in mind. But nevertheless, it's important that you as the reader analyze the writing and identify the logical conclusion. An informative text is a very straightforward piece of writing. Basically, the purpose of an informative text is to educate and enlighten the reader. It's basically to convey information from the writer to the reader. So it's very straightforward because it's not persuasive and so it pertains more to facts and figures. So first off, an informative text is generally non-fiction because it has no reason to be fiction because it again, it has facts, facts and figures in it so it's truthful. So that's why it's always non-fiction. It's generally easily comprehensible because the writer wants the reader to understand what the writer is talking about. So they want it to be easily comprehensible to the reader so that the reader can understand everything that's going on. There will also be a clear structure to the paper. Since it's informative, it will oftentimes have several points or pertain to several things. So many times it will um, go from one point to the next, a very clear structure throughout the entire paper. And like we've been saying, it'll have facts and figures in it. And so there won't be really emotional language. It'll be more straightforward. And then also, an informative text generally does not have personal opinions in it. Because there's no reason to have personal opinions. Because the writer isn't trying to convince the reader in any way. They're trying to just simply convey information to the reader. So that's why personal opinions are not present and are not needed. So the important thing to remember is that an informative text is meant to educate and enlighten the reader. A metaphor is a type of figurative language in which the author equates one thing with that of something else. This sentence says, the bird was an arrow arcing through the sky. Now here, the bird wasn't actually an arrow, but instead the author is saying the bird is like an arrow arcing through the sky. This is a way for the author to get to think about the bird in a different way and to equate it with an arrow and an arrow making an arc through the sky. This is a way for the author to describe the bird in more detail without being direct and obvious because the author could say the bird swiftly flew through the air and bent through the air making a big arc. But that's not very interesting. That doesn't evoke emotion on the part of the reader. So instead in this case the author chose to use a metaphor saying the bird was like an arrow arcing through the sky and because of that the reader can conclude that the bird must have flown swiftly and then bent through the sky maybe going up and then coming back down. Now sometimes authors use metaphors but they don't directly tell you what they're talking about. Here we knew that the author was talking about a bird but look at this sentence. Swaying skeletons reached for the sky and groaned as the wind blew through them. Here we don't know exactly what the author is talking about but we can uh, infer that the author is talking about trees because it would make sense that trees would sway back and forth and that maybe at this point it's in the winter and the, the trees don't have any limbs so it's just like the skeleton of a tree and it's swaying back and forth. So that would make sense here and so sometimes it's a little bit difficult to figure out exactly what the author is talking about. In this case it wasn't but nevertheless this is another example of a metaphor where the author is comparing the trees to skeletons and that 
allows the reader to look at the trees in a different perspective. Now we're thinking about trees as big skeletons swaying back and forth and groaning. And so that's a way for the author to give us a different perspective about these trees without being real direct and obvious. So just to review, a metaphor is, when the, is a type of figurative language in which the author equates one thing to that of something else. Personification is a type of figurative language in which the writer describes the non-human as having human qualities. So look at this elementary example of personification. The car smiled at me. Here the car is described as smiling, but smiling is a human quality. So the car, the fact that the car smiled is personification because the car here didn't actually smile because it's not a human. But for whatever reason it appeared to the rider that the car smiled at them. Maybe the front of the car is configured in such a way that it looks like a face and it looks like it's smiling. Or maybe it was more of just the rider's imagination. But whatever the case is an, is an example of personification because the rider is giving a human quality, smiling, to a non-human. Now sometimes personification can include giving human qualities to animals like in George Orwell's book Animal Farm where animals um, reenact an entire war. So that can be the case as well. But generally I think of personification as pertaining to inanimate objects, but it can be animals as well. The tree groaned in the wind is another example of personification. Here the tree is a non-human, yet the author is giving it this human quality of groaning. Now you may think, okay, if a tree is going back and forth in the wind, it may sound like it's groaning. Well, yes, it may sound like it's groaning, but here the author is saying that the tree actually groaned, which cannot be true because trees don't have mouths. So this is an example of personification, like I said, because although the tree made a groaning sound, the tree did not actually groan. Personification can be used for a variety of reasons, but often it's to make the reader look at something with a different perspective. Personification evokes a different tone than if, like, consider this sentence. If the author just said, the car looked like it was smiling at me, that sentence sounds different than the car smiled at me. So depending on whatever tone the author is going for, the author may choose to use or not to use personification. A prediction is a guess about what will happen next. So when a reader actively engages in whatever they are reading, they naturally make predictions about what will happen next and they base these predictions off of what they have read and what they already know. So by taking what they have read and what they already know a reader can formulate what they think will happen next in the story. So consider this sentence. Staring at the computer screen in shock, Kim blindly reached over for the brimming glass of water on the shelf to her side. So the reader is naturally going to read this and have an idea of what is going to happen next. And the reader will probably notice the word blindly. So Kim is so caught up in what's happening on the computer, she goes for a drink of water. But since she's caught up on what's go going on on the computer, she reaches over without really looking at the glass of water to grab it. So the reader is going to assume that she's going to knock over the glass of water. Now that may not be what happens, but still it's a prediction either way. The prediction may come true and a prediction may not come true. But a reader is naturally going to make predictions about a passage. And it's, uh, making predictions is part of being actively engaged in what the reader is reading. When doing research, it's important to focus on primary sources, which is documentation closest to the subject being studied. Now, some examples of primary sources are things like photographs, recordings, or accounts of people who saw it in person. So you see here, if we were studying the subject of penguins, then some primary sources would be photographs and recordings of penguins and accounts of people who have studied penguins in person. So if I was doing research, this is what, it, this is what I would want to focus on. Now there are secondary sources, which would be things like a review of a movie about penguins or a book outlining the observations of others. 
Now, notice here that a movie about penguins is a primary source, and the observations of others is a primary source. But here you have a review of the movie, or a book outlining the observations of others. So here you have a source about another source, and that's why it's a secondary source. So in research, that's what researchers should uh, stay away from. There's a couple things that researchers should look out for when looking for a primary source. They should make sure that what they are looking up is credible and recent. And the second criteria right here, recent, only matters if um, the subject is still, still um, alive today or still going on. Like if it was research about Abraham Lincoln, it wouldn't matter if it was recent because we're not really discovering anything new about him. His life is already over. But if it was something about the government of Italy, then it would need to be recent because the government of Italy is changing because it's still existing. So that's why it's important that it be recent. It's also important that it be credible so that you know it's true. A great place for primary sources is the internet. Used to, researchers stayed away from the internet because it wasn't a credible source, but now some information on the internet is credible. The best place to look for primary sources is to look for sources affiliated with established institutions, such as universities, public libraries, and think tanks. If there's a website that's not affiliated with an established institution, see if the, um, there's links to that website from established institutions. Like if a university had a link to that website, then that website is probably also credible. Also, look to see if there's information about the author of that web page. Um, many times the author will include any credentials, any education or experience they might have, which increases the credibility of that person. So overall, when looking or when doing research, it's important to look for primary sources. And it's important that those primary sources are both credible and recent. A sequence is the order in which things happen. So it's important that a reader be able to identify the sequence so they can follow along with what is happening in the passage. So a sequence is basically the order in which things happen, or the order of events. To help spot the sequence in a passage, you can look for words like first, then, last, and next. So if you find these words in a passage or other words like it, you'll know that that's showing you some part of the sequence. And so that helps you determine what happened first, then next, and then last. And finally, most sequences will be in chronological order. Basically, chronological means uh, based on time. So if I was talking about my day, I would say, okay, at 7 o'clock I got up, at 7.30 I ate breakfast, at 8 o'clock I went for a run, and then at 12 o'clock I ate lunch. See, that's chronological. It's proceeding through time. Now, some texts might not be in chronological order, and so those can be more confusing when trying to find the sequence. However, sometimes that's the best way to go about writing certain passages, so just understand that not all passages will be in chronological order, but nevertheless, it's important that you understand the sequence of events. So to practice, take a look at this sentence. He walked in the front door and switched on the hall lamp. Notice here that none of these words are present in this passage. However, you can still find what the sequence is here. So you know that he must have walked in the front door first and then switched on the light bulb. That had to have happen second because first he had to get inside the door. So this may seem like a very simple and elementary example, but it's still important to be able to identify the sequence in a passage or sentence. A simile is a figurative expression in which the author compares one thing to that of a, another using the word like or as. So here are some examples. The sun was like an orange, eager as a beaver, nimble as a mountain goat. Here the author is using the word like, and in these two phrases the author is using the word as. Either case is fine, the author just needs to use the word like or as. And so in this sentence, the author is comparing the sun to the orange, saying the sun was like an orange. And this gives the reader a different perspective on what they are reading. It now allows the reader to think about the sun in terms of an orange, 
No longer is the reader thinking of the sun in the sky. The reader is now imagining an orange in the sky. And here, if the author was describing someone as being nimble, no longer are they th just thinking of someone being nimble. They're thinking of that person as a mountain goat now. And so that's the point of a simile. Now, if you're familiar with metaphors, similes differ from metaphors. Look at this sentence right here. This is a simile. The house was like a shoebox. Now, a metaphor, in a metaphor, like would be removed, and the sentence would just say the house was a shoebox. See, in a metaphor, the author never acknowledges that the house and the shoebox are not the same thing. However, in a simile, like stays there, and so the author is acknowledging that house and shoebox are not the same thing. They're just like one another. So the difference between a metaphor and a simile is just kind of the emotion that the author is trying to evoke because metaphors and similes uh, evoke different tones. So the purpose of metaphors and similes is pretty much the same thing, to get the reader to think of one thing in terms of another thing. But writers will choose to use a simile or a metaphor just depending on the tone. Supporting details are very important parts of a paper. It can be said that the topic and main idea of a paper is the most important part. But without supporting details, main ideas and topics are irrelevant. So basically, supporting details reinforce a larger point. So a writer will make a point which may take the form of a topic or a main idea of a paper. So the writer makes that point and then the writer backs up their point with supporting details. And these details are most often found in informative and persuasive text. And this makes sense because if the writer is telling you about something, each main point they make, they're also going to need to back up with more points so that you, the reader can be sure that they are um, being told accurate information. Then also in a persuasive text, if the writer is trying to get the reader to do something or to think a certain way, the writer can't just make a bunch of points. They're going to have to back up those points so that the reader will indeed think that way or take that action that the writer wants them to take. And supporting details are often easy to spot because the writer will let you know that those details are coming. A lot of times they'll make a main point and then they'll say something like first and they'll make us um, give a supporting detail and second and give another supporting detail and then say finally and then give the third supporting detail. Or they might say something like for example or for instance and that would tip you off that the next supporting detail is coming along. Supporting details need to be two things. They need to be both factual and relevant because if something is totally accurate and factual but it's not relevant to the main idea, then it's no good. The supporting detail needs to be accurate and needs to uh, relate back to the main idea. And if a supporting detail is very relevant, if it pertains to the main idea, but is not accurate, then again, it's no good because what good is information that is not true? So the important thing to remember with supporting details is that basically their job is to reinforce a larger point. And they can be most, most often found an informative and persuasive text. They're often easy to spot because they're preceded by words like first, second, and finally, or for instance, or for example. And the most important thing for details to be is both factual and relevant. Text evidence is basically information in a text that backs up the main point or points in general throughout the story. So I want to write up some main points up here about text evidence. So like I said, it supports. The things it supports are the main point or the points throughout the story. So anytime an author makes a claim about something, it's important that they have text evidence. Because when they just make a claim, it's not very credible. And so they add text evidence to it to back up that claim, maybe give a statistic or tell something else to back up the main point or points throughout the story. And text evidence also helps the reader draw a conclusion or it leads to the conclusion throughout the story. So it's important that text evidence is three things. Precise, descriptive, and factual. 
Remember I said that text evidence supports the main point or points in a story. Well, generally a main point and points throughout um, a piece of writing are going to be very general. They're not going to be very specific. So since these things are very general, it's important that there are some specifics in the paper. So that's why the text evidence needs to be precise. That way your paper isn't vague or the writer's paper isn't vague. It's also important that these, uh, te this text evidence is descriptive because, again, main points and points are vague. So it's important to uh, have something very descriptive. And it's also important that they're factual because since the text evidence is backing up or supporting the main points and points, it's important that these facts or these text evidence is factual so that it's actually credibly backing up the main points and points throughout the story. When an author is engaged in a cause and effect analysis, then the author is primarily concerned with explaining why something happens or in describing the consequences of something. And so authors have different goals of a cause and effect analysis. But there are three common goals that a writer may have. One is to outline previously unknown consequences of a familiar event. Another is to speculate about possible causes for a known problem and a third common reason is to show how one thing influences another. So a writer may pick any of these reasons to write a cause and effect analysis. Now, it is not necessary for the author to assert a firm conclusion in a cause and effect analysis. So the author doesn't need a firm conclusion. Often, just asking some pointed questions will be sufficient. So that's kind of a look at the author's side of a cause and effect analysis. However, the reader does have some responsibilities when reading a cause and effect analysis. It's important that you as the reader always consider whether the arguments made by the author are both sensible and coherent.